Welcome to the Making Sense Podcast. This is Sam Harris. Okay, brief housekeeping. Once again, I'm now adding afterwards at the end of these podcasts, so I will save some of my remarks for there. Again, I'd like to urge supporters of the podcast to visit my website and go to the subscriber content page and download the subscriber feed of the podcast. If you are seeing a black Making Sense icon in your podcasting app, you do not have the subscriber feed. You have the public one, and you will be missing some content. And there'll be more of that kind of thing happening very soon, so you have been warned. And as always, thank you for your support. Also, many of you have asked whether the conversations that I'm now having on the Waking Up app can be made available to podcast subscribers. The answer is yes, although we've decided to put them on my website only, not pipe them to the subscriber feed. This is because they really are narrowly focused on the topic of living an examined life, meditation, the nature of consciousness, and many of these conversations are just too specific for the podcast generally. So I I just don't want to hit the average podcast listener who is supporting the podcast with these episodes in his or her feed. So if you want to hear them, they will be on the website and you can listen in your browser and they will soon be posted in the subscriber content section. And of course, if you really want to get into these topics with me and you want to hear everything I have to say there, there really is no substitute for subscribing to the Waking Up app. There's a reason why it's a separate app. And as always, if you actually can't afford a subscription, you need only send an email to support at wakingup.com, and you'll be given a free account. Okay. Today I'm speaking with Andrew Morantz. Andrew is a staff writer at The New Yorker. His work has also appeared in Harper's, New York Magazine, Mother Jones, The New York Times, and many other publications. He is a contributor to Radio Lab and the New Yorker Radio Hour. He has spoken at TED, and he's been interviewed in many places, CNN, MSNBC, NPR. And we are talking today about his book, Antisocial, Online Extremists, Techno-Utopians, and the Hijacking of the American Conversation. And it's an interesting book and an interesting discussion. It gets more contentious than I was expecting about an hour in or so. Andrew is more woke than I realized, and we talk about all that. I can't tell if we disagree more than is apparent in this conversation, or less. I'm going to guess more. Again, I was a little surprised at the line he took through parts of this conversation. This is becoming an occupational hazard. Anyway, I'll have a few more things to say about that in my afterward. And now I bring you Andrew Morantz. Andrew, thanks for joining me on the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So you've written a, a fascinating book, which is a really fun read. Uh, the book is Antisocial, Online Extremists, Techno-Utopians, and the Hijacking of the American Conversation. Before we jump into your book, give me a, a potted bio for you. How do you describe your career as a journalist? Uh, it's a good question. Well, first, uh, I think some people might have a hard time believing that it's a fun read, but I appreciate you saying it because although it is dark subject matter, I did try to find some of the the dark comedy in it. And yeah, yeah, there's a lot of that. Yeah, no, I'm glad that landed because, you know, you c- it can't just be bleakness from start to finish, even though it does get bleak sometimes. I guess I would say I graduated from college in 2006, uh, moved to Brooklyn and became a freelance journalist because that's what all my friends were doing, basically. And, you know, for other reasons, too, I wanted to learn about stuff and pursue truth without sort of boxing myself into one academic discipline exclusively for the rest of my life and wanted to try to write beautiful sentences that also spoke to true things in the world and, you know, all the sort of cliche reasons one becomes a sad young literary man in Brooklyn. And um, 
ended up freelancing for, you know, Harper's New York Magazine, Mother Jones, a variety of places, and did a master's program where I met someone who was leaving an editorial position at The New Yorker and told me that one was opening up. And it was a kind of entry level, bottom of the food chain sort of job there. But I just was so impressed with everyone I met there that even though I wasn't sure I wanted an editorial entry level job and I was in some ways just happier being a writer, I uh, I took that job and then I sort of was an editor and a writer for six or seven years before going back full time into writing mostly for The New Yorker and for this book. It's interesting. So your your, your book is is fascinating because essentially you embedded yourself among the deplorables and you know, so it's it's really a, a report from the front. When did you actually start reporting for the book? Uh, there's kind of different ways of answering that. I mean, in one sense, the idea for the book really gelled once Trump entered the picture, you know, on that mm. on that escalator that we all remember from June 2015. In another way, the preoccupations of the book predated that. You know, I was reporting on clickbait factories and the kind of degradation of online media since 2014. And so it, it, it was kind of, it was a set of preoccupations I had already had. And then once Trump and Trumpism entered the picture, and then from there, you know, various kinds of trollery and misogyny and white nationalism and stuff, it all kind of congealed into something that I felt really had to be a book. But the, the mm. underlying concerns, I think, had, had been with me for a while. They were just kind of inchoate and hard for me to even really put a name to. So before we, we actually begin to walk through your adventure in the book and, and touch specific topics like social media and fake news and gatekeeping and Trump and how the press deals with him. I mean, there's, just a, there's a lot to cover here. But what's interesting to me is that many of us have been isolated in a kind of liberal, scare quotes, elitist bubble. And this book is really a kind of breaking of that spell is what it's like to fully embed in this culture of reaction in their own terms to elitism. And your book offers some considerable testimony to, to what has been happening. But I do have a concern that as we analyze this, we are very likely to be importing our the continued liberal confusion into that context and misunderstanding things. And, and so what I feel like, I mean, this, is, this is now a concern that I've expressed on multiple podcasts, I feel like there's a, the prospect of either exaggerating the problem of things like white nationalism, for instance, uh, and sparking a kind of pendulum swing into moral panic. I, mean, I certainly see that on the left. I see that especially clearly because there are people on the left who think I'm a white nationalist which is completely insane. So as we walk through this, at various points, I'm going to want to question whether or not the, the way you see the, the data you, you were confronting, the data being these, these conversations with people, is the only interpretation to which it's susceptible. So with, with that caveat, let's just wade in and... Well, just to, just to add on what you're it, saying yeah. before we get going, sure. I think that's all yeah. stuff I'd, I'd be interested in exploring in the conversation. I guess one thing about being blindsided and being in a in a you know elitist bubble and all that stuff it's sort of fully yes and and also no i mean on the one hand i do find it sort of inexplicable that trump could have any base at all in this country on a kind of like a priori level on another level i you know was the guy sort of betting my friends that he would win because i had that read of the political landscape even though i was sort of you know incredulous about it, I still did think it would happen. And there was kind of a lull right. in, you know, October 2016, when I sort of finally accepted, okay, I guess all the polls can't be wrong. But up until then, I did sort of have a sense that it was not only possible, but in many, at many points, probable. So I definitely own the, uh, you know, latte sipping, glasses wearing Brooklynite label that I very clearly <laughs> wear. But I also, you know, I think there, there are bubbles and there are bubbles. And yeah, I think it's possible to see out of them. And in some cases, all you have to do to see out of them is just, you know, 
do a Google search or a Facebook search and and there it is. So I definitely everybody has their biases and I have mine, but um I do think that the sort of liberal elites who can't even believe that Trump, you know, misspelled a word on Twitter kind of, you know, caricatured, you know, we get carried away with that sometimes, I think. Yeah, no, I actually had forgotten that part of your book where you you detail your impressions with respect to Trump. So I, I was more in the bubble than you were, except I was struck by the detail you flagged that the New Yorker had not prepared a cover for a Trump victory. They only had a Clinton cover, which was yeah fairly amazing. Yeah. And there is a degree to which, and we can get into this too, but there's another kind of bifurcation here with re- with regard to the New Yorker, because in a sense, the New Yorker is kind of a minor character in the book. And there's a way of reading what I do as a kind of, you know, parody of the New Yorker's, you know, insistence on putting accents on, you know, the word elite or, you know, yeah. the diarysis or whatever. And like that stuff is fun to mock and I'm happy to mock it lightly. On the other hand, there is this sort of strange almost reversal that I experienced where my natural tendency is to be pretty anti-authoritarian and contrarian and anti-establishment in many ways. That's kind of my natural instinctive tendency. And yet I find myself kind of coming to this from within the kind of inner sanctum of elite American journalism. And I guess there's a lot to say about it. We can explore many angles of it, but I guess there are just different kinds of elitism and many of them, most of them are obviously bad. And I think that from my experience of The New Yorker, from being inside it, it actually doesn't subscribe to that bad kind of elitism nearly as much as I would have expected. I mean, I expected a lot of snooty, elbow patch wearing, you know, all the stuff you see on The Family Guy or something. I didn't, that, that hasn't been my experience. It has, however, been my experience that there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of discriminations being made, you know, with regard to which piece is better than another piece or how a piece should be structured or which arguments withstand scrutiny. And so it is, um, hierarchical in that sense. You know, it is a gatekeeping institution in the sense that it takes great care to decide which things to publish and which things, you know, not to. But so, I mean, that's just to sort of mark that as to the extent that that is um, hierarchical, you know, there are different ways of being hierarchical, some more arbitrary than others. Yeah, well, I once wrote an article titled In Defense of Elitism for Newsweek, and and then John Meacham helpfully retitled it, When Atheists Attack. Uh, <laughs> I still so, think yours so, uh, is more clickable, but uh, yeah, that's right. maybe more meretricious. Right. Yeah, I was, I was uh, going after Sarah Palin mm-hmm. back in the day. Mm-hmm. So um, let's start with social media. I mean, you, you make the... So I think many of us feel that social media is somewhere close to the root of the problem. You know, that coupled to the the advertising model for digital media and the and the primacy of clicks. You point out in a recent New Yorker article, I don't think you make this point in your book, but that, you know, the Gutenberg revolution unleashed similar problems, right? I mean, the, the, you know, the printing press had, had liabilities in that it, it allowed for the amplification of misinformation. And Martin Luther is often celebrated as a sign that, you know, the printing press enabled the Reformation, but as you point out, it also allowed him to spread his murderous anti-Semitism and ushered in something like a century of religious conflict. But it seems that there is something special about the time in which we're living, and this notion upon which Facebook and these other companies are founded, that linking people digitally is just an intrinsic good, that hasn't really survived contact with reality these few years. Yeah, it it unfortunately survived, I think, a few years beyond where it was plausible. And that extension of a few years was enough to, in part, give us Trump and Brexit and Bolsonaro and Modi and, you know, Duterte. I mean, I could go on. But Mm. but yeah, I think you're right. It's it's the worm has kind of turned on that one. I think, you know, in the space of, you know, just the few years between when I started embarking on this project and when I'm putting it out into the world, I've been shocked at how much public opinion has swung from, in my view, one sort of extreme to the other. 
And I think that's helpful. I don't think that it's, I don't think we're all the way there yet in terms of nuance and understanding, you know, obviously there's a lot of helpful stuff bundled together with a lot of really dangerous stuff. And I don't think on a large scale, we've really teased it all out yet. I guess to your, to your point about whether it's different, I think, yes, it's different in the sense that, well, two things. One, I think because we relied on a really unrealistically oversimplified idea of what liberatory technologies do, because a lot of the, because a lot of the, you know, young men who started these social media companies were just sort of assuming that their technologies would be like the printing press and that the printing press essentially did nothing but help us move toward progress and democracy and all the rest of it. They had an opportunity, if they had had a more nuanced view of it, to build in protections right from the beginning, and they didn't do that. And so they set themselves up for more pain than was necessary. I also think that even though the early publishers and printers in, you know, Renaissance Europe were ambivalent about their status as gatekeepers, they did come to accept pretty quickly that they had that role and responsibility. And the social media founders worked really hard to deny that they were gatekeepers, to deny that they had any curatorial responsibility, to deny that they could be held accountable for what happened on their platforms. In some cases, they're still trying to deny it, again, without mm. without any plausibility in my view. So yeah, I think it's the combination of these massively powerful tools with all kinds of denials of the idea that the tools could have any negative impact and that if they do have any negative impact, well, we're just not responsible for it. Um, I think that is unique. Plus, you know, now we have nukes and climate crisis and, you know, just things that they didn't have to deal with back then. Do you think the gatekeeping problem is soluble? I think it can be improved. I don't have a perfect solution in mind, but I think one key thing is for the engine of virality to be moved away from what it currently is, which is what I call activating emotion, or I don't call it that. The scientists that I cite call it that. Mm. I think that's one big thing you could do where instead of the current system, which measures engagement and engagement is measured by proxies for, you know, essentially things that increase your <laughs> galvanic skin response, you know, anger, lust, laughter, you know, just these very kind of animalistic behavioral responses. If you moved away from that as the coin of the realm and moved into a, a more, you know, balanced system where those emotional reactions were mixed with other kinds of reactions, you know, more slow brain kinds of reactions, more pro-social reactions, to use the mirror image of the book's title, that would solve a lot. The problem is it's really hard and it might make the companies a little bit less money. Yeah, well, I mean, there is just this problem which you cite in the book that fake news consistently spreads faster than the truth and it is because we're we've optimized for these these activating emotions we've created a, essentially a quasi darwinian system that selects for outrage and misinformation it's, it's a machine for generating controversy and you could see how you might tinker with the settings there but it may just be a fact of human nature that the lurid incredible, terrifying, and divisive is stickier than something that tells us that people are mostly good most of the time uh, and that, you know, order is progressing. Yeah, I, I would agree that the lurid and the, you know, that those things are, are stickier inherently. I guess my hope would be that you could build a system that doesn't just privilege those things. I mean, we tend to assume that what we see on social media is just kind of a, a flat reflection of the popular will or that, you know, because we're seeing a lot of something, that means that, you know, a lot of people want that thing to be out there and, you know, that it's just sort of a flat reflection of democratic urges and desires. I guess on one kind of immediate level, that's true because there are people or bots in many cases, you know, clicking on the things. But in another sense, it is you know, there's a system that is conditioning people to behave a certain way. So, you know, it may have always been the case that lurid and 
false and, you know, sensationalist things got more attention. But, you know, if you were a producer of a newspaper, let's say, yeah, there was plenty of yellow journalism. There were plenty of penny papers and partisan presses and all the rest of it. But they also had a sense of shame. They also were, you know, members of a society that could be made to feel that they should stop, you know, goading society into war because their buddies would look down on them if they did it. Or that, you know, they would do it for the beginning of part of their career and then try to look much more high-minded for the latter part of their career, like Joseph Pulitzer did. So I guess, you know, I do think that human urges can be pushed back against when you have people in charge of the systems who are willing to try. Yeah, I guess I'm just, I'm sympathetic with this distinction that every social media overlord wants to draw between a publisher and a platform. And uh, you know they consider themselves the latter, and and therefore have more or less um, kind of happily abrogated any curatorial responsibility that you or I would want to assign to them. And I, I do understand that just because of the sheer scale of the problem. And but for the fact that we might invent some AI that is truly competent you know, and doesn't make egregious errors, you know, just censoring, you know, normal Republican senators as, you know, neo-Nazis or whatever the, the failure would be. There's a difference between, you know, you, the New Yorker making a decision about who to publish and what sort of views to amplify, or me making a decision about who to speak with on this podcast. I think those kinds of decisions have to be made responsibly. And I, and I, I take it seriously, the, the, the concern about whether it makes sense to give someone a platform or not, you know, and, and there are many people I've, you know, there are people you, you spoke with in your book who've asked to be on the podcast and who I've decided essentially never to speak with because I think they are at least beyond my Overton window. And even there, I'm, I'm somewhat conflicted because part of me, you know, I'm, I'm somewhat idealistic about the prospects of just shining sunlight on bad ideas. And insofar as I think I'm capable of doing that, it's tempting to do it with any bad ideas of consequence. But um, I don't know, when you, when you talk to someone like, uh, you know, Jack Dorsey or anyone who's running a platform of this kind, it's hard to see how they can ever curate this correctly, you know, in a way that doesn't cause more problems than it's solving. Because I mean, there's just so many casualties of their inept efforts to curate. I mean, there are people who have received lifetime bans from Twitter for saying things like men are not women. In that case, that was considered hate speech against the trans community. I mean, so say more about what y your sense of optimism that we should even move in that direction. But what if the technology on some level just doesn't allow for this to be done in a way that is going to solve this particular problem? Yeah, there's a lot in there. And I, I so I've, I'm rarely accused of being an optimist. So I, I appreciate that. I don't think I'm very optimistic about their ability to do it, certainly not their ability to do it flawlessly. You know, we can get into specific cases. I think, you know, my instincts on the trans stuff might be different than yours, but just, you know, we can take any number of examples. But I do take the larger point that there's problems of scale. It's never going to be perfect. And that in some cases, the, the medicine could be worse than the disease when it comes to banning people or, or kicking them off. I mean, I get that in principle. And I am, I am definitely sympathetic to how hard it is for someone who's in charge of one of these platforms to make these very tough decisions. I don't think I have all the answers or that if I were in charge, I would know exactly what to do. I guess we kind of have a different starting point, though, where, where it seems like you might be starting from the, you know, the system as it exists and then saying, well, how can we expect them to know exactly who to ban when? And I guess I would start a few steps back in the causal chain and, and question how the system was built in the first place. I think by the time you get to the point of deciding who to ban or who not to ban, it's, it's in a sense too late and you're dealing with symptoms instead of root causes. I mean, just because you brought up the example of Jack Dorsey, he's been going around for the last six months or so saying, well, I think it might help if we you know, got rid of follower counts. I think it might help if we didn't incentivize likes and follows and, and shares as much as we incentivized other things. He hasn't done any of that. I'm not sure why he hasn't done it if he thinks mm. it would help. But I mean, I think I do know why, because it would make the company less profitable and its, its profitability is a big question mark right now. But, but that's just one example of how there are structural changes that can be made that are way 
above the level of do we ban this account or not? And I think what that gets to is the notion that these things were not built with this stuff in mind. You know, Facebook right. is right now working on abdicating some of this responsibility, but they're doing it by building a so-called Supreme Court of Facebook. That is not a body. <laughs> that is not an idea they would have entertained even three years ago. So there, there are different ways of getting around this problem. It's not just to curate or not to curate. Yeah, it, it's interesting to consider what would happen if we could curate perfectly. Let's say it's an error-free you know, Nazi detector. But then you still have the question of when these platforms become more or less identical to internet infrastructure, which you, you could argue that some of them already are, you know, so, so that you could draw an analogy to something like the phone company, right? So let's say that the phone company could perfectly detect when people were spreading, you know, Nazi ideas in their private phone conversations. Should the phone company just shut down those accounts? That's sort of the territory we're in, if we actually could do this well. Just to address the point you just made, I mean, I guess the analogy... I would use is that the phone company would be more analogous to, you know, CrowdStrike or or not CrowdStrike. That's the thing in the Ukraine complaint. What's it called? Cloudflare. Cloudflare. Yeah, exactly. That yeah. that there would be deeper layers of internet architecture. To analogize the phone company to Twitter would be to imagine that the phone gives you extra points every time you say something, you know, really exciting or you know something that really riles people up. That you know when you're on a conference call, if you call someone a douchebag or something, you know, you get 15 extra points like you're in a video game. If the phone were tilting the playing field in that way, then the phone, yeah, I think would have more of a gatekeeper analogous responsibility because the phone would be affecting our behavior in a, in a proactive way. Okay, well, let's jump into the book properly. So you, so you really go behind the scenes with a fairly motley cast of characters, none of whom... I've met in person, I think, but some of whom I've had various skirmishes with online. But there is this larger issue, which you know we, we should touch on, which is just this guilt by association algorithm that is running on the left. I mean, this really is a problem of, of the left, where if you talk to someone, you know, who's ever spoken to someone who has spoken to someone who's a Nazi, you're a Nazi, right? No one can survive that scheme. You have spoken to someone who's spoken to someone who's spoken to someone who's a Nazi. And well, I, I've spoken to all of them. So yeah, but you, I mean, you, you have spoken with them. You could argue to, however amicably, you're you're actually unhorsing them and their worldview, or to to some degree doing that. This is not. No one is going to argue reading your book that you gave these people platforms. In, in or at least I, I wouldn't expect that would be a common charge. I would hope not. Yeah, I think that's right. I, yeah. I set out to see them through a critical lens from the beginning. And there is a confusion that I think a lot of journalists have and a lot of the public has about journalism. And it's a, it's a good faith confusion. It's not easily resolved between being unbiased or objective or any of those words and being someone who, you know, takes in the evidence of your senses and more and more of those things seem to be at odds. So there's a way of that I could have approached this project where I could have said, well, I'm just going to quote what they say and I'm just going to kind of, you know, transcribe it and be a stenographer to power and that's that. Or I could have done what I did do, which was be really critical and in some cases really acerbic and mocking, which I think was deserved and in some cases necessary. But you can't really do both. I mean, you can't always be both even-handed and tell the full truth. There's a difference there between me using the material I've gathered to tell the story I want to tell and, you know, handing the microphone to someone to tell the story they want to tell. I think that's a meaningful distinction. Does having hung out with these people in person noticeably corrupt your objectivity with respect to how you portray their ideas? Or I mean, do you think you're you're less combative in your treatment of, the, of them and their ideas for having you know, broken bread with them and, and shared long car rides and all the rest? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I can't know for sure. I've only run that experiment once. I don't have a control group. But I think you probably do have a control group in that there, there are other people you cover who you 
presumably don't meet face to face even. Mm. And you know what that's like, right? That's a good point. Yeah. I mean, one thing I do try to do, it's not just a sort of straight ahead taxonomy of shitty people on the internet. You know, I do try, it's sort of using them as fodder to tell a larger story. But I do try to take care to taxonomize to the extent that, you know, I don't want to run together differences and conflate differences. You know, some of them are Nazis, some of them are not. Some of them are white nationalists, some of them are not. Some of them, you know, are just kind of diehard Trumpists who I find absurd because they hold that opinion, but I actually am fine with talking to in all other respects. And some of them I just find kind of skin crawly and creepy all the way through. So it is case by case. Now, the question of whether, you know, the case by case accounting is different for cases where I've hung out with people versus not, I think it's hard to say. I mean, the kind of journalism I do mostly requires just really being a fly on the wall for long periods of time. And there are some people who do that kind of longitudinal, immersive style journalism who just don't do it about people they don't think they're going to like. I mean, I have colleagues and friends who say, Mm -hmm. I don't want to write a profile of someone unless I am reasonably sure that I'm going to enjoy their company because I don't want to spend my time in a combative environment. And I also just don't want to take on the responsibility of writing a really sharp, critical piece in the end. And I just would rather write an admiring piece. Now, obviously, I'm not one of those journalists, but I I was always on guard against the possibility that they were playing me or that they were using their time with me to try to subtly lobby me toward a more flattering picture of them. In some cases, I think there was no danger of that, such as the cases of, you know, me, a Jewish journalist talking to a professional anti-Semite. There was very little chance that I was going to see eye to eye with that person. And yeah, in the end, even in cases where there wasn't that direct of a conflict, I don't think that I was hoodwinked by any of them. And and at the same time, I don't think I overreacted to that or overcompensated by trying to go harder on them than was merited. But I mean, it's really not for me to decide. Mm. Yeah, there is an interesting effect of you know, compassion creeping in for better or worse, where, I mean, just as the reader, I mean, you, you know, the, one of the more odious characters you talk about is uh, this guy, Mike Enoch, who I, I knew nothing about. That's his pseudonym. What, what's his real name again? Uh, Painovich. Painovich, Mike Painovich. But when you get the details of his childhood and his life, it's, it's pretty easy to see that there's a, a psychological explanation for at least you know some of his obsession with these ideas and and you know the, the misuse of his own mind i mean he's he's a smart guy who's spending all his time being an anti-semite yet married to a jewish woman or i guess no longer married to a jewish woman once once she discovered the nature of his podcast but i mean the, the whole thing is so depressing you know that it's it's hard not to just see him as a casualty of something i mean it's like his 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 own agency kind kind of erodes and you just see you know but for the fact that he wasn't you know fed a, an endless supply of prednisone because he had such horrible eczema as a child things might have been different and um it's those kind of details which if you're just dealing with the ideas you know if, i just find if i'm just reacting to someone because they're putting out terrible memes that's one level where I can ju- just deal with the ideas and I can be as uncompromising as I can be. But then if you hung out with someone and gotten a sense of their humanity and all of the exculpatory or potentially exculpatory influences on them, you come away sort of not knowing how harshly to judge them a- as a person. I-, I-, I felt the same thing with Cernovich, frankly. I mean, I've never met Cernovich. He's attacked me a bunch online and I you know, responded in kind a little bit, but then I just sort of got more of a sense of, you know, how complicated it was it was to be Mike Cernovich, and I just couldn't keep it up anymore. You know, it just seemed like, all right, this is just it's not worth interacting in a hostile way with this person at all. And yeah, so I just don't know if you if you felt that in your reporting or not, because as a reader, I, I felt it. You know, meeting some of these guys, it just felt like. It's uh, you know I wouldn't want to trade places with any of these people, so um, how harshly am am I going to judge them? I think you're right that 
spending a lot of time with these people, both as a reporter and for you as a reader, it does change and deepen the way you see them. And that was part of my goal. I think it's tricky because you don't want to let people off the hook for their terrible behavior. And there's a really fine line between empathy and excuse, or, you know, you use the word compassion. I don't know how many layers deep we want to go. It's kind of deep in my ethos that I try to have radical compassion for everyone. I try to have compassion for Donald Trump, who's obviously suffering from one or more personality disorders and who... It would be easier to have compassion for him if you felt that he was actually suffering. Right. But <laughs> That's uh, true. He, he, That's I, true. You're using suffering in a, in a different sense because, I mean, we're suffering from his, his neurological disorders, but he doesn't appear to be suffering from them. You know, I think in the first few minutes before he can actually get the TV to turn on in the morning, I think he probably experiences immense suffering. Right. But I, you know, obviously don't know. And in a sense, it doesn't matter, right? Because what I really try to do, and I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm, you know, able to do this always. I'm not some Christ-like saint or anything. But I do think on some deep level, the goal is to try to have empathy for everyone, even the worst people. Now, that obviously doesn't mean that you excuse what they're doing. And I, every fiber of my being thinks Donald Trump is a bad dude. It's just like, what do we really mean by bad? We mean that he behaves badly. He's bad for the world. He's bad at his job. You know, you can go down the list, but does it mean that he is condemned on every level that he, you know, is a soulless creature who's not a human being? You know, I mean, if you really, really want to get down to the core of it, a part of it has to do with, you know, you, you mentioned the concept of things might have been different in these people's lives. And one of the deep sort of concepts that I'm wrestling with in the book is this concept of contingency and how history might have been different and people's lives might have been different. And that, yeah, there is this kind of deep existentialist effect of a kind of, you know, giant pachinko machine that we're all in. But I think the key, and I didn't expect to be talking about this kind of stuff, but I think it does get to that deep level pretty quickly because I think the key is to try to hold at once the sort of existentialist absurdist notion that nothing is predetermined and that we're not on a automatic track toward progress and redemption while also not, you know, becoming nihilistic and feeling that life has no meaning. And so part of how that for me applies in this case is to think that on some level, of course, people need to be held accountable for their actions. And of course, there's a massive moral difference between being a professional anti-Semite and being a professional nurse or <laughs> bus driver or, you know, I mean, like there are differences in how we act in the world and they're immensely meaningful. But I, I really struggle with saying that, that, that the deepest and most complete explanation we can give for someone who does bad things is that they're a human dumpster fire, and that's the only thing we have to say about them. I actually think it's more incumbent on us, again, not to excuse, not to look away, but to actually understand the complexity of it. And, and, and in no way to say, oh, if you grew up poor or if you had eczema, therefore you can do whatever you want. Absolutely not. Or that we have to agree with, you know, we have to go from 100% condemnation of their behavior to 90%. It's not that at all. It's just that on some deeper level, you know, my... My wife has been a public defender in the past, and their sort of ethos is, you're not the worst mistake you ever made. And it's really, really hard to apply that to Nazis. I Trust me, it's not instinctive. It's not mm. intuitive. And again, I don't claim to be some Gandhian figure who just naturally, intuitively does that. I mean, Nazis make me upset. They make me angry. I, I get why people want to yell at them. I get why people even want to punch them. And I, I don't claim to be above that. I just think it, it's not the only place to land. And I also think it doesn't help us understand anything. I mean, it, there are different projects, right? There's one project that is about fighting the ideas, which is valuable. And there's another project that's about diagnosing and understanding where they come from. I, I think they're both necessary. Mm. Well, there really is a problem of understanding what's going on, because in addition to having Nazis out there and, and you know extremists of various types, we have this other problem, this layer that is built, you know, around it, on it, you know, some, somehow interacting with it of what we might call troll culture, 
and there's just this new style of insincerity or apparent insincerity or you know irony usurping every other value which creates a problem of assessing what people actually believe and intend or you know even if you do grant that people should be taken literally even in these contexts it's hard to know just how committed they are to these specific ideas there's a culture of just deliberate obfuscation around this where you know as you report there you know, some of these people are you know i think this was i forget which website this was but you know it was explicit that they wanted it to be hard for the normies to tell whether or not they're joking right right and contained in that is the implication that you know most of the time we're not really joking right or you know we're not joking about some of the worst stuff how do you think about troll culture and what should be the appropriate response to it because the response i'm seeing more and more in the mainstream media and on the left is just taking the worst possible construal of everything as the literal truth of everything yeah and i i get where that impulse comes from and you know Look, it's really, really complicated. I mean, I say a couple times in the book that trolls set this ingenious trap, right? Because if you're a good troll and, you know, I think the president is good at very few things, but I think trolling is definitely one of them. If you're good at it, you don't leave people any good choice, right? If you pay any kind of attention to a troll, you're letting them win because what they want is attention. If you let their views or putative views or offensive jokes or ironic whatever go unchallenged then they also win so it's a kind of trap and i don't think we've figured out a good way out i think you know i have a a, a little part of the book where i'm i'm at the white house briefing room and um i'm there with uh this kind of you know just just he's he's a, essentially a, an insurgent in a in a dirty culture war who is acting as a White House correspondent for a gateway yeah. pundit. So I'm there kind of shadowing him and sort of seeing how, how far he can go in the... He's essentially just performing. He doesn't actually ask questions or intend to ask questions. He's just there to kind of act out the degradation of the norm of the press briefing room being meaningful at all. And right. while he's there... But nonetheless... He and, and others in this vein were just adorably excited to have been granted press credentials in the first place. Absolutely. You know, so they're, they're subverting it as the, the norm of this institution is like, this is just a worthless goof. And yet this is the biggest day in my life that I get access to the White House. Totally. I mean, yeah, you see that all over the place. You see that with all kinds of reactionaries and proto reactionaries and wannabe authoritarians that, you know, our whole system is meaningless and, you know, should be consigned to the waste bin of history. And yet, as soon as I have any power within it, I'm going to flaunt that power to the maximum. Not that these guys were really reactionaries in the sense that they had a consistent ideology, but just that they, their impulses run in both directions. Mm. But while I was there with him, a few of the real reporters who were there called him out and sort of confronted him on camera. Or, you know, everything is on camera these days because someone just holds up a phone. And they wanted to nail him to the wall. They wanted to nail him on having a view that was inarguably beyond the pale so that they could prove that he didn't belong there. And they couldn't really do it because they didn't, well, because they just didn't know exactly who he was. And so they kept saying, well, you are a white nationalist. And he said, well, my boyfriend is Colombian, so... I guess I'm not a good white nationalist, you know, and right. he was able to kind of win that round. Now, even though they weren't wrong in their intuition that he didn't belong there, he absolutely didn't belong there because he wasn't even pretending to be good at being a journalist. I mean, he in some level was pretending, but just in the barest, most superficial way, he, re he really was mm. to the extent that what happens in that room is meaningful at all, which we can, you know, call into question. But to the extent that that kind of journalism is meaningful, he shouldn't have been there. But they couldn't really nail down why. And the reason I ended up being so scene dependent in the book is because I feel like I went round and round in my head about these theoretical concerns and 
reading into the history of questions of journalistic ethics and reading public opinion by Walter Lippmann and thinking through how democratic institutions do or don't survive and all of which was an interesting thought exercise. But then, you know, to just see a scene like that playing out in front of your eyes and seeing how even when something is obviously going awry, it's not always easy to name it accurately or to decisively prove it. And so to me, to get back to the substance of your question, that kind of seems like it it suggests two different things to me that may or may not be at odds with each other. Like, on one hand, it seems to me like you want to be really minimalist and limit yourself to only lodging accusations that you absolutely know to be true, because otherwise, you know, you could set yourself up for for humiliation. On the other hand, when you're dealing with a really slippery, gifted troll, they're not always going to give you the ammunition you need. So if you limit yourself to only the barest assertions of fact, you're just letting them win because you are allowing a liar to dictate the terms of the debate. So, of course, I don't advocate for making up accusations or for, you know, misinterpreting jokes as reality or vice versa. Obviously, in a vacuum, you want to get things right as often as you can. But the problem is they don't say what they mean. They don't give you the courtesy of, of, of telling you who they are. And so I get why people try to, you know, why sometimes people overplay their hand, because you, 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 you have to get outside of their setting of the terms. Well, many of them tell you who they are, or they tell themselves who they are when only their friends are, are listening. I mean, so if you, if you listen long enough to many of these people, I think the mask, if they're ever wearing one, does come off. Sometimes. Yeah, so let, let's go to one of the kind of the harder cases, which are more, by definition, more mainstream. And here, I think our intuitions might divide a little bit. And again, I mean, my intuitions here are now you know, sort of newly anchored to the experience of being on the other side of this. I mean, being targeted by people's poorly calibrated racist detectors. So like, take the cases of Tucker Carlson and Laura Ingram. Right. So these are both people who I've been interviewed by. I've never met either of them in person, I don't think. But, you know, I've been interviewed by each of them a few times, you know, not recently. But you single them out essentially as as racist dog whistlers for things they've said recently. And I think so Laura Ingram said, you know, Democrats mostly want to replace those old white Yahoo conservatives with a new group who might be a little a bit more amenable to big government. And that you read as a dog whistle. I believe I can read that more charitably just as a fairly factual statement. I mean, there's so many people on the far left who are banging on and on about white privilege and using whiteness and age and gender, you know, it's so old white men being the filter against which they would make almost any political decision. I mean, they're, they're advertising this about themselves. And it seems you know, it to be charitable to Laura, and that's an impulse I don't often feel, she could have just been remarking on that and not dog whistling to actual racist, much less expressing her own racism. Yeah. So I believe you that you can parse that in a way that you see it as not a dog whistle. I guess I don't see it that way, and I don't really see why you... I mean, I, I look, I get that it's always possible to read a quote literally as not racist in the sense that the person is not literally saying in the quote, I, a racist, believe that the races are... that the white race is superior to the non-white races. Like, in any quote where somebody's not saying those words, it's possible to read it as not racist. I haven't listened to every episode of your show, but I've heard some former episodes where I've heard you do this a few times with Trump, you know, saying, you know, yes, he told, you know, these women of color to go back to their countries, but I'm not sure I see that as a racist dog whistle. And I guess I guess I don't see why we we should ignore what's right in front of us and not take the obvious inference from it. There there is a a, a very well-known poisonous theory called the great replacement theory that we all know now because they were chanting about it in Charlottesville. And so to the extent that people didn't know about it before that, which 
I would argue it's probable that Laura Ingram and Tucker Carlson did know about it before that, but I can't prove it. But we all know about it after that. To then traffic in those words, replacement, and give it an explicitly race-related valence, and then to turn around and deny that you're trafficking in race baiting, I, it just it it just beggars belief. And I I don't, you know. Plus, you can put it together with a decades-long history of of doing similar things and of of supporting policies that have those effects. So I guess I just don't I, I don't see why we would try to contort ourselves into you know trying to. I I get the point of being charitable to people, but this doesn't seem charitable. This seems implausible. I mean, I, I can give you an answer to that question. I mean, why? bend over backwards to be charitable, even in the case when you're dealing with someone who you have other reason to believe might be racist. I mean, as in the case with Trump, I just simply don't know enough about Tucker or Laura to have any prejudice about their social attitudes, really. So, I, But in the case of Trump, I have a, a, a fairly strong sense that he is you know, not a white nationalist, maybe not a an ideological racist. I don't think he deals w with ideas of any kind. But I think he's, you know, at minimum, an Archie Bunker style racist, like he's just not comfortable with those people or not as comfortable or just, you know, likes white people more. And yet, if you're always going to read into every utterance the possibility that that utterance is a dog whistle or a sign of lurking racism. I mean, there's several problems with it. One is, if you're going to seize upon the utterance, right, then it's going to have the same valence when someone else speaks those same words. Like, like that utterance is, is now radioactive. Well, maybe, but not always. I mean, I, well, look, two things. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll let you finish, but I, Firstly, I don't want to set up a straw man. I don't I'm not arguing that you should always see everything as a dog whistle to, you know, you use the word always. Obviously, I don't think you should always do it. I think you should do it. I don't think you should never do it. <laughs> That's what I mean by bending over backwards. Yes, of course, I believe in being charitable, but I don't think this is charitable. I think this is taking something that I think has a pretty clear valence. And just because it doesn't have the words I am a racist in it kind of just willfully refusing to see it. That, that's, that's how I would perceive it. Well, I mean, the problem with the dog whistle hypothesis is that it really is unfalsifiable. It is conspiracy thinking of a sort that gives us all these conspiracy theories that are, that, whose adherence just cannot be reasoned with. They find the anomalies everywhere and demand that you make sense of them and there, in, in most cases, there is no sense to be made. And if you turn up your dog whistle detector, you will find it everywhere. I mean, it's just, you know, and again, I've been on the other side of this. Yeah. And, you know, me mentioned it on my podcast enough so that it's, it's in incredibly boring for listeners to, to hear me whinge about. But, you know, it, there is no answer to somebody saying, well, that's a dog whistle when they can read a dog whistle into anything. Yeah, I, I can see why you have a particular sensitivity to it. But I, again, I really want to stay away from always and never. And, you know, yes, if you turn your dog whistle detector up to 11 and you try to see it everywhere, that's a bad approach. But I also think it's a bad approach to never see it. And I, I think you're verging in this case and in other cases on never seeing it. I think you're narrowing the, the possible field to literally utterances where someone says, I am a racist. Or, you know. Well, no. No, I mean, it's not that. It's just, it's, it's much more around. I mean, I mean, I guess let's just decide what racism is here for the purposes of this conversation. I mean, for me, it is, someone's a racist if, a racist of a sort that we should care about if their political aims in some way entail living in a society where people of different races don't have the same political freedoms. How about living in a majority white society? Wouldn't that make you a kind of white nationalist if you want to live in a more white nation or a majority white nation? Yeah, well, I mean, so, but that does entail the, the principle I just invoked, which is I mean, how do you get to a majority white society? I mean, you're infringing on somebody's political rights to get there. Or you're, I mean, to, to stick with the example of Laura Ingram and also Tucker Carlson, one way of maintaining a white majority is to invoke replacement theory to scare 
old white people into wanting to close the border and put babies in cages in order to protect their white majority. That would be one way of doing it. Right. But so again, this gets us into the dangerous territory of the way most people on the left wrangle with that concern is to assert that any serious conviction that we'd need defensible borders or that we should be able to admit who we want into the country and keep others out, that is synonymous with racism. No. What I'm saying is when someone tells you my border policy is based on my specific invocation of race vis-a-vis me saying that this is about protecting white people from being replaced and or about calling immigrants dirty in the case of Tucker Carlson or referring to them as criminals or... (laughs) You don't actually cite those statements in your book. And again, I said, so assuming Tucker is sane and not racist for the moment, when he called them criminals, he might have been saying that it is a crime to sneak into the country and we can't not treat it as a crime. That could be the what he meant by calling them criminals. Again, I, I didn't I'm not I don't know what you're referring to, but well, I mean, I'm referring to a few instances, one of which happened after the book went to press, so I couldn't include it. But I mean, Tucker has done this many, many times. And, you know, I'd be happy to ask him in person what he meant, and I'm sure he'd be able to come up with an explanation. But I, I just think, look, at a certain point, when you have a pattern and practice of behavior. Yeah, you could say, well, my concerns with the border are just purely economic. And, you know, instead of reading all the economists, I've only read George Borjas. And I've been convinced that, you know, this is a drain on our economy. And, you know, it has nothing whatsoever to do with race. You could say that, except that then if you're Laura Ingram in the quote we're discussing, you're tipping your hand by saying, no, this is about white conservatives being replaced. That is, my, that is where my concern about border policy is arising from. So, I mean, in the absence of that, maybe we could talk about whether her border policy has anything to do with race, but she's just told us that it does. Well, actually, so it's possible that I didn't understand the context of this Ingram quote, because I just read this as, so the, again, the quote is, Democrats mostly want to replace those old white Yahoo conservatives with a new group of people who might be a little bit more amenable to big government. Yeah, she means people from South and Central America. It's very clear in context. Right. Okay. So yeah, I, I didn't know the, the connection to immigration here. I thought she was more or less just saying we, we, we have, basically, she was just summarizing intersectional identity politics and let's get rid of the old white conservatives. Well, and that's why these words are important. And I, I, I agree with you that you can't go so far into dog whistle conspiracy territory that anytime someone uses a word you don't like, you accuse them of, you know, I, I get that there are ways that this could be out of whack. But I also think it's the case that when someone who has been steeped in nativist politics, let's call it, for decades, uses what is very clearly an echo of the great replacement theory, which has that word replace in it, which is about a globalist conspiracy to import brown people to dilute the white majority of the country. Again, I can't prove that that's what she meant. And I'm sure if she were here, she would deny it. But again, this this takes us back to the to the ingenious trap that is set by people who are either just out and out trolls or people who are not saying what they mean. You know, a lot of people don't say what they mean because they know that they can have a better, more effective conveyance of their message by going halfway towards saying what they mean and then, you know, not spelling it all out. It's much easier for Donald Trump to call shithole countries you know, shithole countries than to say, I think they're shithole countries because they have black people in them. Obviously, he's not going to say that, but it's very clear to people what he means. Well, again, no, I mean, for me, it's not. It's a thankless job defending Trump or any of these other people who I disagree with more or less across the board. And in, in certainly in Trump's case, I'm more or less sure that he is guilty as charged. But again, the question is, are these utterances evidence of the crime? And so what utterances are ones that fall into the... Ca- I mean, I'm curious, what, what has Trump said that makes you think he's a racist? For, the thing that's truly dispositive for me is that, that I believe I know to a moral certainty what he's like behind closed doors, right? And I know that the apprentice tapes exist and that you can hear him using the N-word with abandon, not, you know, like it's linguistics class and he's talking about the power of the word, but 
he's using it because that's what he calls black people when he's, you know, totally unguarded. So I guess I would be worried about setting the bar at you have to be a celebrity who's taped on camera repeatedly using the N-word and anything short of that is not. That's not the bar. If you're going to refer to shithole countries as a a rich guy, pseudo billionaire who likes everything in his life gilded, it seems to me the variable there is not race. The, the salient variable, the necessary variable in order to understand the utterance is not race. It is squalor and poverty and disease. And it's he's talking about the developing world. And if you could find me a country filled with white people who are as poor and chaotic as what you find in Congo, well, then he's talking about them too, I, I, right? Or he would be. Yeah. I mean, whatever. We can get stuck on this forever, but I don't think, I don't think that I, I, I think Slo- it's a super Slovenia, important point. where he got his third bride from, I don't think he would refer to that as a shithole country. I think, you know, and again, there is, there's a certain amount of speculation involved here, I, I, I grant you, because trolling involves, to use a term that maybe is like overdetermined at this point, involves a certain amount of gaslighting. It really does. I mean, I know people throw that stuff around and, you know, it gets worn out. But what trolls do is they don't say what they mean. And it's crazy making because you try to nail them down and they squirm away from you. So, like, yeah, I think it was like in that same utterance when Trump was calling Haiti and African countries shithole countries that he said, we need more people from Norway. Like, come on, how how Hmm. explicitly does he need to say it? I'm going to grant you that Trump shows every sign of being a racist, right? So it's just that if statements like that are unequivocal signs of the speaker's racism, then they have to work for other speakers. Then anyone, no matter how blameless their record, if they say something about shithole countries, they're a racist, right? And I I just don't think that runs through. No, I think think context matters. I, I think it's a little disingenuous to say, oh, you know, once you say that word, then nothing else you've ever said or done in your life matters. I mean, I think context matters. But just look at the people who are, I mean, you know, know that I need to lecture you about cancel culture, but this is what has given us cancel culture. It's the narrow fixation on the magical power of words given their worst conceivable interpretation. Well, I guess to maybe maybe one way of trying this from a different angle would be just to say, like, I, I take your point about how these things can be underdetermined and how, at the very least, like I like like with the example that I started with, with the with the example of Lucian Wintrich at, in the briefing room. If you accuse someone of something and they are very plausibly able to deny it, you lose a point, right? So at the very least, it might be a tactical error. I, I get that. On the other hand, the solution cannot be. We will never call anyone a racist unless they say I am a racist. And I, I, or, and, I, and I still don't really understand what your proposal is for getting out of that. But that's a straw man version of my position here. I mean, clearly there are racists who will answer to the name. Clearly there are people who are, you know, bigoted and, they ha- and they're so lacking in, in introspection or awareness of these issues that they don't even understand the shape of the dark cloud that they're trailing behind them, right? They're not ideological racists, but they're, again, they're Archie Bunker types. But then there are people who just are using words in ways that would have been quite normal 20 years ago, and everything is being subjected to a different litmus test. Well, I guess one way, I mean, I I would assume that you can feel sympathy for the bind that we find ourselves in, we being just people of goodwill who don't want this country to be overtaken by rogues and idiots and liars and monsters, when people keep not saying what they mean, saying the opposite of what they mean, pretending to hide behind irony or humor when they are actually trying to perpetuate racism. Milo is a good example of this. Yeah, but I'm saying that So clearly there is such a thing as the sort of the trolling strategy, and I'm not disputing that dog whistling ever occurs. I mean, there is, it is an idea for a reason. But again, when applied to people in general, it quickly becomes unfalsifiable unless you catch them in some other context where they they take the mask off. Well, I would say two things. Well, three things. I would say one is 
that that is an impetus to work harder to catch them. And by catch, I don't mean like, you know, shame and humiliate and dox them. I mean, catch in the sense of like doing your homework and trying to figure out what people actually mean and where they're actually coming from. So that would be one part of it. You know, I mean, just since I mentioned Milo, everything he's ever said, he's has cloaked under a guise of I'm only joking, darling. The left can't take a joke. I'm just, it's just PC culture has gone awry, you know, and then but what he in fact does is make fun of trans people to the point where it, he's implying that violence should be done to them, make all kinds of specious and dangerous arguments about immigration. And, and like, do I know that in his heart of hearts, he does or doesn't mean it? No, I don't know. And in fact, I think it's actually deeper and scarier than that, which is I don't think he gives a shit. I don't think he thinks about it twice. I don't think he has strong beliefs about anything, but that doesn't mean that he doesn't have effects in the world. No, okay, but, that was that, but that's a very different case. I mean, I actually would put Milo in his own circle in this Venn diagram, touching probably no others, because his main quality as a person is a total lack of sincerity that's yoked to a, a master va value of just wanting to be famous. Right. So he's just a pure provocateur. Well, I don't know that he cares about anything or believes anything. I'm sure he's more or less sincere in finding the left despicable and ridiculous. But I've never seen him seem like he had a, a real moral core to him, unlike I mean, really everyone else in your book who's you know captivated by one or another crazy opinion. But it's not all about just getting a rise out of their audience and getting more clicks. In, in, yeah. At least, at least I, I would, can't think I, of another case. I would grant you most of that. I, I guess the way I would complicate it would be by saying, I think that the core impulse of someone like Milo is just fame and attention. And I think that's actually true of other people in the book. I think that's largely true of Lucian. I think it, to some degree, is true of Cernovich. But, you know, but, but, but I don't want to make these things fully mutually exclusive with other things. I think you're, you know, you, your sketching of interlocking circles and Venn diagrams is is accurate in that it's not, and I don't think you would say that it's all one or all the other thing. I think these things are always intertwined and playing off of each other. So yeah, I, I think there's maybe some longings or desires that are more prevalent than others, but you know, it's also the case that Milo, his email password was a was a Nazi meme and he wore iron crosses and he has very consistently advocated for America being as white as possible. So I guess at a certain point, there's like a, a diminishing returns aspect to, to going, okay, if we strapped him down and gave him a truth serum, would we learn that it's more of the impulse toward attention or that it's more that he has a sincere belief in white nationalism? Clearly, he's been interested in playing with white nationalist and Nazi tropes for a long, long time. And clearly, he has allied himself with institutions that, you know, Breitbart having a black crime vertical on its website, you know, these things are not random. So yeah, he goes toward where the where the attention is. But I don't think that there aren't other valences at play, too. And I think that's true of everyone else in the book. Yeah, but all, all of this puts me in mind of the, the larger political concern that my foremost concern near term politically is that we just not have four more years of Trump. And it seems to me that attacking half the country for their white privilege and unacknowledged racism is a losing strategy. It seems to me that the left, certainly the far left, is, is totally committed to doing that. And they're in the process, perhaps, of convincing the Democratic Party to more or less do that, or at least pander enough to the far left so as to have their message be indistinguishable from that for the rest of the country. And it just, it just seems like, one, it seems untrue, right? It's not that everyone who voted for Trump is a racist. And it's, it's not that everyone who's concerned about immigration is concerned about immigration because they just want to live with more white people. Yes, of course, these things are complicated. And I, I think you're right to not want to make a cartoon out of anyone of course. And I mean, obviously, when you spend years with people, you know, sometimes they come out cartoonish when they act cartoonish, but most of the time they're not. And so I don't think of people as cartoons and I don't think of everyone as being the same. I guess I might reframe it as 
rather than thinking about the danger of, as you say, attacking half the country, what if we framed it in terms of how do we fight racism? If we if we set the bar at a place where, and, and, and maybe some definition of terms is necessary, I'm not only thinking of racism of the like, I don't want to shake a black person's hand variety. I mean, I think that there are meaningful structural differences between people who want to structure our society in order to make it more equitable and people who don't. And yes, there are certain words that are very radioactive and maybe it's not that helpful to use the word racism in that context. But I think if you, if you think about the sweep of American history, white supremacy has very clearly been a problem all along. And I don't think that problem has gone away. So I think of course, I don't want Trump to be reelected, but I also think I don't think we can just suspend the fight against the historical legacy of white supremacy until that happens for fear of, you know, pissing off a few Trump voters. Well, I think it's beyond pissing off a few Trump voters. I just think it's a strategy that seems guaranteed to get him reelected. Take again, not to spend too much time on this, but I think it's a very instructive case. I mean, to take you know two hosts on fox news as examples of white supremacy and you know conscious dog whistling to white supremacists i got to think that is something that half the country or something like half the country will consider ridiculous they'll think that one they like tucker carlson say and they're not racist and they don't see any sign of racism in him so what the hell is the left talking about? Well, I guess I would say a few things. One, I mean, just to put it in context for people who haven't read the book, it's a 400-page book, and you're referring to, I think, two paragraphs in it. Yeah. So it's not like there are yeah. multiple pages where the names Tucker Carlson and Laura Ingram even come up. So, I mean, I don't want people to think that I'm writing a book about Nazis and trolls and that my prime examples are Fox News hosts. Well, no, but it's a, it's a complicated picture. And again, this, he doesn't appear very much in the book, but what's interesting is that he you're, to some degree, led to your surmise of him because of the way in which he's embraced by these self-described Nazis and, and anti-Semites. I mean, so you have well, right. these people so in the book. That's the other missing piece of evidence here is that I, I didn't claim that these were conscious dog whistles. I quoted Nazis who read them as dog whistles. Okay, but that's not the same thing as uttering a dog whistle. I didn't claim anything about how they meant the utterance. I claimed what what effect it had. Well, no, but I mean, like you you take the 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 most odious thing I think that you quote from Tucker, or at, le at least you quote it in the in the spirit of holding it up as evidence of his racism. He, he at one point says, "In what sense is diversity our strength?" And you know that can be read as I'm a white guy who just wants to be around more white guys. Message. It's also a, a question that has to be fair game, you know, well within the Overton window when you're talking about understanding society, right? I mean, this is a question that sociologists and, and psychologists and anthropologists have to be able to study. And I mean, you probably know there's been work done in this area. I mean, Robert Putnam published a famous paper, I think about 10 years ago, showing that increased racial diversity did decrease social trust. Right? I know and, it well. The the yeah. alt right guys talk about it all the time. Yeah, exactly. And so, it, and it's been debunked to some degree. But and again, it's not literature that I've paid much attention to. But its debunking hasn't been decisive. I mean, so it's like it, it it could just be a fact that for a variety of reasons, as diversity goes up, social trust goes down. Maybe it just goes down when the change is happening. Right when the percentiles are shifting and then it stabilizes. But this is just something about human societies that, you know, the facts are whatever they are and they need to be understood. And it can't be synonymous with, with white supremacy to want to understand those facts or to report those facts, whatever they are, when you do study them. You know, I don't know what Tucker was, was into here when you quoted him, but it's, you know, maybe he was re referring to, you know, having Ro Robert Putnam thrown at him. I, I don't know. But it's just like, if that is the thing that convicts you of white supremacy, there's so many people who are going to be defenestrated by that yeah, principle. I, just to be clear, I mean, I, you may be misreading the, the context here. I, I, I didn't write this 
to say, here is my view of what's happening inside Tucker Carlson's brain. And again, this is literally one paragraph. It's not a book about Tucker Carlson, but I'm happy to stick on this example if you want. No, but but the point is that you can't just look at the effects in the world. It, ma- it matters what a person's actual intentions are because you almost sort of did it with Robert Putnam here. When I referenced Robert Putnam, you said, yeah, I, you know, the white supremacists I know keep banging on about him as though some of that odium spread to Putnam. No, I mean, that's right. And now, I, now you're imputing meaning to me that I didn't. I... At least that's the effect of the way you said it on me, right? And I would imagine some listeners, like there's something shady about Putnam if he can be used in that way. I mean, Putnam has zero control over what people do with his work. And you might think, well, that, you know, knowing that, you should decide to avoid certain topics because you don't know how the facts are going to come out. That's a separate topic. But I mean, that I would probably agree with you for certain topics. But if we're not going to really care about what someone meant, you know, we're just going to play connect the dots with some stream of effects in the world originating with what they said or can be made to seem to originate with what they said. Well, again, no one is going to survive that moral calculus. Yeah. So I I do want to be really clear. I mean, again, this is going pretty far afield. I don't mention Robert Putnam in the book. I feel like kind of the the ghost hovering over all of this is the ghost of Charles Murray, who I also don't mention in the book. And I know this is colored by the experience you've had with this stuff. And I I think that's fair. You know, we all filter things through our personal experience. But well, well, I would say, I mean, that's a totally fair point. I would just say that because I've had this experience and because of, you know, I have this podcast and I'm in conversation with so many people around this, I just see that this is a virtually universal experience. And it's an experience that's not showing up in a way that most people can notice it. I mean, a lot of this is happening in private. I mean, this is like, so just to connect this to Charles Murray for a second, this was the experience of having heard from some of the most famous scientists in the world in the aftermath of that podcast saying, I'm completely on your side here. This is absolutely despicable. What's being done to you and what was done to Charles was absolutely despicable. But of course, I, I'm not going to say, I can't say that in public, right? And so you don't, you know, I mean, I'm sure you as a journalist could go fishing for that and probably discover that. And this is where people like Mike Cernovich are right. You know, it's like, and, you know, and Mike Cernovich, again, is somebody who I haven't wanted to touch with a 10 foot pole, but. The kernel of truth that is animating Trumpistan, right, if not worse, has to be dealt with by right-thinking, well-educated, well-intentioned people like ourselves, and has to be dealt with honestly, otherwise we're completely fucked. I agree with that. And I, I think we might differ about how we should deal with it. And I think maybe I'm just a little bit less completely allergic to saying things that might anger white people than you are. I mean, but that's never the filter for me. I mean, again, that's it's not about matter of angering white people. One, it's a matter of not being honest about facts. Two, it's a matter of using a test that's going to snare many, many innocent people, white, black, brown, whatever. I mean, like the people who will get canceled if we have the wrong algorithm for our, you know, our racism detector, we already see this happening. I mean, the thing that I'm really reacting to that I keep encountering on the left is this ends justifies the means kind of principle. It's like, you just got to break a lot of eggs to make this omelet. And I'm not going to worry about the person who I know is not racist, who just had his career destroyed around charges of racism, or the person who got me too who I know was just you know, making a dad joke. I think that's what's happening on the left. And Trump wins that every time. Well, yeah, look, I mean, I think we, we've both agreed that there are dangers to setting various bars too high or too low. And I, I think where we're disagreeing is on which trade-offs are preferable. I grant you that there are some people who are not conscious of their racism. There are some people, you mentioned people who would think, oh, well, if you're calling Tucker Carlson racist, I will find that ridiculous because I like Tucker Carlson and I don't think he's racist. I, I grant you that that's possible, but I also think some subset of those people are more racist than they realize. And I, I don't want to be in the position of 
grand vizier of deciding who's racist and who's not. I don't think that's productive. And, and I really don't ever in the book talk about people's heart of hearts beliefs that when I don't know what they are. I, I actually just don't even think that's all that valuable as a way of thinking about this stuff. I don't actually really believe in free will. So I don't, I don't think it's that important. I, obviously, look, I, on some level, I act as though I believe in free will. And, and to return to our earlier topic, I definitely, on some level, want people to be held accountable for their actions. And so on that level, of course, intentions matter. But I don't think intentions are the only thing, or in a lot of cases, even the main thing. I, I think it might actually be clarifying if I if I read that Tucker Carlson paragraph, because I think that there that'll clear up some of the confusion. Before you do that, let me just tell you why I think intentions are so important. Because in, intentions, and again, and you know, I famously at this point also don't believe in free will, right? But it doesn't make these kinds of conversations any less important. Right, I agree. In, intentions matter because they are the only thing that indicates what the person really wants to accomplish and what they would do if if they could do what they wanted you know which is to say you know as they get more power the only guide to what the future will look like in their company is what their actual goals are what their actual aspirations are and so you know it matters if somebody is really a white supremacist though they're not admitting it or if you have a bad, you know, racist detector and it's on you, right? Well, yes and no. I mean, I think in a, at a lot of points in our conversation, I've kind of wanted to make the lines between things a little more fuzzy than than I think I'm hearing you make them. I mean, I think you've had a few sort of very stark binary distinctions that I just don't think reflect reality very well. And I think this is one of them. You know, the the, the distinction between someone who is an out and out white supremacist and wants to exterminate all non-white races but and and someone who as you call it is an innocent archie bunker type racist i don't think that's as firm a distinction as you seem to think it is not now i, I want to be careful i'm not saying that every archie bunker really wants to exterminate everyone that's not at all what i'm saying it can be a continuum but it's a fairly binary claim or allegation to make to say that someone like tucker carlson is dog whistling on his show to white supremacists. All right. Well, let me let me read the paragraph, and I, I really think that'll clear up the confusion right. because I didn't say dog whistling. I didn't okay. say what was in his heart. I didn't say what his in, uh, intention was. So let me read the paragraph. And for context, it comes on page three hundred twelve of a long book that that we're, we're, where I'm getting to is wrapping up where I think we're at in terms of our national discourse. Now, the purpose of this, as you know from reading the book, this passage is not to say, okay, in my long litany of diagnoses of who are the bad people in America, it is now time for me to come to Tucker Carlson. That is absolutely not the context. The context is me trying to come to some sort of, not conclusion, but some kind of ending note about what has happened to our national discourse. The preoccupation of the book, or one of them, is the hijacking of the national conversation, what, what Richard Rorty calls our national vocabulary. And, and what has become of it. And so I'm really much more concerned with, broadly speaking, vocabularies than I am with condemning individual people for what's in their heart. So in that context, what it says is, alt-right talking points kept drifting toward the center of the national vocabulary. They were repeated again and again by YouTubers, by talk radio hosts, even by sitting members of Congress. And there I'm referring to Steve King in a footnote. And here's the Tucker part. Virginia has transformed politically because it has been transformed demographically, Tucker Carlson, the most popular cable anchor in his time slot, said in November 2017. 12% of Virginia is foreign-born, and that has made all the difference. They've replaced you. Like Roy Moore, who I referred to above, Carlson was making a naked appeal to white racial grievance. The word you could only have referred to white people. The word replaced seemed like a clear allusion to the alt-right's great replacement theory the substance of many of the slogans and chants in Charlottesville. I am bending over backwards to be charitable to Tucker here, but you can read you differently there. I mean, he, he said 12% are foreign-born, so you is not just white people. You is anyone who is not foreign-born. Anyone who was born a U.S. citizen. So you think he's talking to all the 
black descendants of slaves who are Republican voting Tucker Carlson viewers? If he said he was, how could you dispute it? I mean, but this is why trolling is effective, because I can't prove anything. I can just know the, the, the clear sense of what you're saying. I mean, trolling exists clearly because there's evidence of it and people talk about doing it. And you, you have some of these people talking in your book. But trolling requires another layer of metacognition and intent and you know, cognitive bandwidth to be running in the background, right? Like your insincerity is, is taking up some of your cognitive overhead. And it's kind of like lying, right? Like, so if somebody's lying, they're playing a different game than, than when they're just misspeaking, right? Or they're just confused. And in this case, it's a very specific allegation to make about someone like Tucker Carlson that he's trolling here or that he's dog whistling or that he's consciously walking a tightrope that he can walk on Fox News without getting in trouble. But really, he's got something far more sinister that he's communicating to the people who are, who are already in the know. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I would grant you that if the claim is that to say Virginia has transformed politically because it, it has been transformed demographically, they've replaced you, and, and that you want to make... You, you, you indigenous Virginians. Well, we're not talking about indigenous Virginians. They were killed when the white people got to Virginia. But if No, but, he, but he, he's not setting his way back machine that far. He's talking about the people who are not recent immigrants to the country. Yeah. I, Again, I'm, I'm, I'm channeling Tucker here. Who knows what he's saying? But I'm just saying it's, it's susceptible to a different reading. Yeah. And I guess what I would say is lots of things are susceptible to different readings. I, I still think that we can't be so eager to find alternative explanations that we don't account for the likelier explanations. I think we can keep track of all the potential explanations. And, you know, I wouldn't sign an affidavit saying I know what was happening in Tucker Carlson's heart when he said these words. That's why I didn't write that in my book. I just think it, it's, it's just a little bit of a, of a self-defeating exercise to say, yeah, he could be, I mean, when he talks about political transformation here, it's just a fact that white people in Virginia vote Republican more often than non-white people. So to, to, to take the potential explanation that he's actually talking about non-white citizens, I, I just, it's possible, but I just don't see how it's more plausible than the, than the more obvious explanation. Well, again, I mean, the, the, the problem I have is if you, if you overfit for this, you'll catch many innocent people and, or, you know, many allies, right, or, or erstwhile allies who now hate you because you just called them a racist. Well, I didn't. I didn't call them a racist, but I do think... No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about... I'm talking about I'm, you, generally speaking, not you personally. Well, no, I know, but I guess, I guess another way of thinking about it is I, I, I agree with you that you don't want to be so cavalier and say, oh, well, some eggs have to be broken to make an omelet, that you just run around willy-nilly accusing everyone of everything. I, I, I agree with you on that. I guess... At some point, like, I guess I'm struggling to understand when there would be a point where you would say, you know what, instead of worrying about cancel culture and worrying about misapplying the term racist to certain white people, I'm actually going to be more concerned with how we have very public demonstrations of people in Congress on TV saying things that are clearly corrosive to the civic fabric of our country. Why is that not a bigger concern than, I mean, I get why you're concerned about cancel culture and why that has a personal valence to you. I get all that. Take me at my word here. I'm, I'm concerned for many reasons, but the chief reason for the purpose of the topics we're touching here, among its many other negative effects, the near-term concern is that I think it's a losing strategy against Trump. And the person I'm, you know, the, the person who's Bloviations, racist and otherwise, most concerns me is Trump. Yeah, I, I do get that. And I, well, one thing is I don't think we can only have short term goals. I think we also need to have long term goals. And my long term goal is to get to a post racial society where we can't imagine that generations of human beings had to talk about any of this bullshit. Yeah, well, I just, I don't think we can get there without doing a lot of work to uproot our history of white supremacy. And I mean, we might disagree about that, but I don't think we can get there by ignoring race. I think it's quite the opposite. We certainly can't get there by ignoring racism, but 
clearly the, ignoring race. No, but the there the there we're talking about, or at least the there I'm talking about, is a there where race is a deeply uninteresting distinction between people. If we're going to get to a future where race is much more like hair color than anything else, how would you imagine that we're going to get there by paying more and more attention to the significance of race? Well, it's a big question, and, and I, I don't... The question answers itself. I, I don't think it does, actually, because I, I don't think, even if we agree that there's some far-off moment where you know race isn't interesting that we want to get to, we can disagree about how what it's going to take to get there. I think even if that's your goal and, and you can kind of envision it in some far off kind of Ursula Le Guin future. I don't think we can afford for it to be that far off, but I, I don't even think it need be that far off. I mean, it, just look at the gains we've made around the acceptance of gay culture and gay marriage. I mean, the gay marriage battle was totally lost and then it was suddenly won. Part of my frustration here is that the path to progress seems wide open, but for the fact that we keep attacking each other rather than just simply walk the path. Yeah, so that that is the clearest disagreement I've heard between us so far. I, I don't think the path to progress is wide open at all. I think, yes, it's miraculous that the Overton window shifted in the in the correct direction on gay marriage as quickly as it did, and I don't at all deny the possibility of fast progress. But I think it's a really, really different case. I, this, this country and its economy was not founded on oppression of gay people. It was certainly there. But the engine of the economy of this country for a long time was slavery. And I know that we can get stuck in all kinds of debates about reparations and what would it mean? And, you know, is Marianne Williamson's reparations plan ridiculous and ta Coates and whatever. And again, none of that is in my book. I'm happy to talk about it. But I think the big disagreement that it sounds like we're having is I think we need a truth and reconciliation commission before we're going to get to a post-racial future. I, I think that our attempts to constantly say, oh, it's behind us, it's behind us, you know, we have a black president now, therefore we're, we're, we live in a post-racial country. I mean, I just think it's folly. I think it's like, you know, if, it's like if you were in India and you had thousands of years of, of building an entire culture and religion on caste, and then you wrote a, a constitution in 19... 19- 47 that didn't mention caste. And then you said, okay, we're a post-caste society. Like, that's, it's ridiculous. Well, no, I mean, that's a good analogy, though. I, I think if you simply abolish the caste system and then punished anyone who tried to hold on to it in any consequential way, you could move forward without... Well, two thing, yeah, two things there. One, by saying punish anyone who attempts to hold on to it in any way, it sounds like you're advocating for extremely stringent Orwellian speech laws. I'm not I'm, well punished in two ways. Punished that you make certain things illegal, right? Like you have you have actual political equality, so that when people infringe on their neighbors' political rights based on caste system or on you know racism in our case, well then there are laws against that. But two, people get punished reputationally when they actually declare their support for ideas that are now despicable. Like the Great Replacement Theory. Right. So I think... You I mean, I guess, so the, the reason we're, we're coming to... to I, I now see why we're disagreeing here, because, look, they did try to do that in India. They, they said, we have written a constitution that abolishes caste. And we've tried to do that here. We've tried to make all kinds of laws that punish people for racist behavior. We've tried to outlaw redlining, and we've tried to outlaw discrimination in the criminal justice system, it's not perfectly effective. It's not even largely effective because you can't uproot all racism. And I mean, I don't think racism is even strong enough. You can't uproot an entire structural history of white supremacy by just willing it to be so. And, and to get to the second part of your point, look, we can disagree about specific cases. I think you're right that people sometimes hear dog whistles where they don't exist. I think we can find specific cases where somebody was treated unfairly that you and I would both agree with. But the larger point is that you just made the case for why I think social opprobrium is an important tool in some cases. When people are going on... We totally agree about that. So, And, and hence, it, it's such an important tool that we have to use it correctly. Mm -hmm. If it's too blunt a tool, it's no longer a tool, right? Or, it, or it's just going to create more grievances that then have to be addressed with more opprobrium. I definitely agree. I think we just disagree about 
when and where to apply it. And that's why I really, I wasn't trying to paint a, a caricature or a straw man of your position when you were talking about the apprentice tapes. I really am trying to understand, I worry that you're setting the bar way too low or, or too high or whatever. I forget which <laughs> direction we were going, but I worry that by saying you're never allowed to use social opprobrium unless it's literally a tape of someone using the N-word. I, I, I just, I don't think that's good enough. That clearly isn't my position. We've spoken about this as though there were binaries to be found. And, and I think there are some fairly bright lines that once someone crosses them or, or fails to cross them, that should matter. But there are clearly continua here and people who seem to shift their position at least a little bit in ways that seem to matter. And so, I mean, some of the characters in your book are guilty by association with, with one another, but are also both differentiate themselves from one another. And, you know, and, the, and these kind of lack of alliances seem relevant. So I mean, you have someone like Mike Cernovich who, and again, this is all also just a little gray too. I mean, so you have someone like Mike Cernovich who will disavow the alt-right and certainly disavow white nationalists, but, you know, he'll still be associated with someone who won't. I think that one scene you write about, I think it was Gavin McInnes who started the Proud Boys, and, you know, I think he disavows white nationalism and racism, but he also will hug Richard Spencer when, he, when they show up at the same party. So how did you think about who is who among these cast of characters? I mean, were there were there bright lines that were not at all permeable, or did you find people who seemed one way and then revealed themselves to be another way, and you had to revise your opinion of them? Yeah, um, it's both. I, I I think, you know, I think it's right to search for bright lines where they exist, but then I also think often, as you just said, it's a, it's a little gray sometimes or or often. So I I think the only way to really figure it out. And I, I'm not sure that I figured everything out, but I think to the extent that I did figure stuff out, it was just by hanging around a lot and putting in a lot of time and attention to what they actually do. I mean, I, I would have been totally journalistically accurate if I had gotten a quote from Gavin McInnes where he said, I'm not a white nationalist and I don't have any problem with Jews and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then left before he revealed himself to be have some kind of behind the scenes relationship with Richard Spencer. Now, that's not to say that that's some aha moment where I go, oh, I now know that you secretly agree with everything Richard Spencer has ever said. I don't think that's true. I don't think that's responsible journalism. And I, I do take your point here and elsewhere that guilt by association can be a dangerous thing. I mean, I've even seen people reproduce a picture of Richard Spencer having a drink with Julia Yaffe, who's a journalist, mm -hmm. and as if that's evidence that she is in league with Richard Spencer. And it's like, she's a journalist. She's going to talk to a source. That's what journalists do. So I, I definitely understand how that can be taken too far. I this gets even more extreme. I mean, you even have Noam Chomsky going on Stefan Molyneux's podcast, right? Like, I won't go on his podcast, right. but Noam Chomsky will. So is Noam Chomsky a, a white nationalist? closeted reactionary. Uh, I doubt right, it. Right, exactly. So you can question whether Chomsky should have done that. But yeah, I don't think it makes sense to impute all of his views to, to him. I, I take that point. I do think, though, that when you're dealing with people who really expertly and repeatedly shade the meanings of what they say and misrepresent what they mean, and even are in some, in some cases, their own intentions are opaque even to them, I, I just think the way through that is to pay closer attention and marshal more and more evidence. And in some cases, that evidence is going to be anecdotal. I mean, you know, you've, you've used the word data. And I, I think in some cases there is data, but in a lot of cases there really isn't. Or sorry, I don't know if you're a plural data person. I'm a singular data person. But I, uh, I, I just sometimes what you have to go on is not, you know, surveys or studies or I mean, as we know, you know, polling data aren't always that useful either. So like sometimes you just have to see what's in front of you, connect as many dots as you can. And and that's why that's why I did object to the the Tucker stuff because I was careful to only say what I thought I knew and that's why I used the word seem when I meant seem and you know, I don't always know what people really believe. If you if you put a gun to my head and said how much 
of Richard Spencer's ideology does Gavin McInnes agree with? I really would not be able to answer you. I just really don't know. Mm. I, I just know how he acts in the world. And I know that a lot of these people are playing with fire. And that's why, again, I, I don't want to I don't want to caricature our positions into saying that you only care about intentions and I only care about effects. I think we're both aware of the other side of that argument, but I just think effects matter. And I think when people keep coming back to playing with the fire of really dangerous tropes again and again and again and again, there's often a reason. Well, no, no, I, I certainly worry about effects. I mean, the, the one effect I keep worrying about here is that we'll elect Trump again, despite our best intentions. So yeah, I, th I think you have to worry about both. But intentions, what somebody really wanted, though they got some other spectrum of effects, they really wanted something else. That should matter because that's that's the only clue you have to what they'll do next time, right? Yes, well, yeah, yes, I, I agree. But uh, I think if you asked Donald Trump when he was a Democrat in 1999, or even when he was whatever he was in 2000. 15. If you asked him, would you like to be in charge of an administration that puts babies in cages and psychologically traumatizes them forever? He would have said, no, that's not my intention. But, you know, he did it. So I, I, I just and yes, Trump is a special case and his brain works or doesn't work in special ways. But I, I don't think it's always a clear path between what's in someone's heart and, and what the effects of their actions are. Yeah. What you said a moment ago, actually, connects to some of my other concerns here is I, I think that the reason why I'm so worried that we talk about this precisely I and mean, that we, that, that allegations of racism or dog whistles or anything else in the space be precise and that we give people the benefit of the doubt when there is doubt is that to fail to do that just makes it harder to know what's actually going on in the world. I mean, like, like as you said, you know, polls can be unreliable. Certainly what people will say can be an unreliable guide to what they think. And we know that preference falsification is a problem, right? So we, mm. we, we live in a society where there are very strong norms about believing one thing, and there's so much social pressure that you feel the moment you begin to demur on important points that everyone just kind of learns to lie about what they actually believe. And then you're, you know, in the in the case of the Trump election, many of us are just blindsided by the fact that nobody was telling us they were going to vote for Trump, though some people were. Yeah, and I and I also think that you probably have a lot of people when the Overton window on same sex marriage shifted so quickly, you probably had a lot of people who were, to make a bad joke, still in the closet about their homophobia and probably still are because it's not socially acceptable to be an outright homophobe anymore. So I think a lot of people just kind of sit on it and suppress it, and I think. You could make the argument that that has deleterious effects. You could make the argument that that actually has salutary effects because we get to move on as a society and stop engaging in this despicable practice. I think it, is, it certainly has good effects and we can move on decisively when, when we can. And I, I think in that case, we can. And I think you know, homophobia will, will erode in the next generation just because a new norm has been established. And I think what many of us are concerned about, you know, more in the center politically here is that it seems odd that when so much progress has been made on many of these issues, you know, you know, the problem of racism among them, we seem to have convinced ourselves that the emergency has somehow gotten worse. Any acknowledgement of the progress is paying, you know, just empty lip service to you know, norms that need to be overturned, right? You know, yeah, so, so to I, cite I, that we've had a two-term black president, you know, that's evidence of nothing, right? That's how, how dare you? That's an expression of mere white privilege. I think that it's understandable that that would be a kind of pendulum swing moral panic in response to Trump and Trumpism. But on some level, it feels like it's given us Trump and may yet give him to us again. Yeah, I see what you're saying there. And I guess to use your word of charitable, I guess maybe I would want to be a little bit more charitable to some of the people. Again, I, I don't want to speak for everyone who cancels everyone else or everyone who, you know, is doing the behaviors you decry. I mean, I, I would probably decry some of them, too, if we got into specifics. But 
I do want to be a little bit charitable to people who are trying to set a new norm that is anti-racist in the same way that, you know, you, you just said, if you set a norm that it's no longer acceptable to be even ambivalent about gay marriage, then that helps society progress. Now, we can definitely agree or disagree about specific means of how people get to an anti-racist society, but I, I do want to just stipulate that there are lots of people who aren't just psychotic, who aren't just virtue signaling, who aren't just deluding themselves, who are actually trying to set new norms that would move racism into the past, and that I think that by overweighting, by undervaluing that concern and by overvaluing the concern that some Trump voters in Pennsylvania might feel alienated, I, I don't know the perfect way to weight those, but I, I just don't want to weight one and to the full exclusion of the other. And I also don't want to, you know, I'm pretty critical in the book of the whole language of political spectrum. So I don't necessarily want to inscribe, you know, the center is, you know, where civility happens and, and the far left is where people, you know, just make incoherent arguments and, and you know, are, contradict each other. I don't think we can talk about people who, who are more civil than others and people who are more hypocritical than others, but I don't think that maps onto a political spectrum in any reliable way. And I guess in terms of, of what you're saying about ignoring progress, I guess what I would say is, you know, social upheavals happen when they do for a variety of reasons. And they don't always map perfectly longitudinally onto the amount of progress that has been experienced in one realm or another. So, you know, there was a kind of social upheaval in 1967 the way there wasn't in 1961. To me, that doesn't just mean that, you know, things were that much worse in 1967 than they were in 1961, and, and therefore they were intolerable. It might actually be that when things actually, when there's a glimmer of hope or when the the the, the sort of change you're seeking starts to seem like it's happening, that's in fact when the upheaval gets more intense. Yeah, I just, uh, what many people are yearning for is an honest acknowledgement of gains that have been made and, you know, transgressions that haven't occurred. I mean, we, there's just, there are many perverse ways in which we fail to track what's actually happening and why it's happening. And so it's just, I mean, to take it to another topic entirely, but this kind of makes the same point. I mean, the fact that people's sense of their own well-being and their own, you know, wealth and flourishing is, in almost every case, mostly comparative. You really could have a society where all boats are rising with an amazing tide of, of abundance, but if it's also increasing, you know, in this case, wealth inequality, people can be getting less happy even though everyone's getting wealthier just because they're, they're seeing that the people at the top get wealthier still. The question is how to think about that, talk about that, correct for that, such that we can also acknowledge what's happening. You know, again, in that case, that the standard of living is going up for, for everybody, at least in certain places, right? I mean, this is the kind of thing that, you know, Steve Pinker runs into when he publishes one of his 600-page books telling people about all the progress we've made, and they look at him incredulous, thinking, what planet are you living on that you think we've made progress? But, you know, on many of these points, the data are there, and it's not an accident that we're not living in societies where, you know, even the wealthiest people are, you know, defecating in their own hallways without running water and dying of tuberculosis and cholera. You know, it's just to not acknowledge certain forms of durable progress is, you know, in the end, morally perverse, because then you're, you're motivated by the sense that no progress has been made. Yeah, I, I take that point. And I, I just, I think it goes both ways. I think, you know, Pinker makes a strong case in the blank slate and elsewhere that, you know, obviously progress has been made. I also think it's the case that you know, there have been times when our assumptions and our, our biases have blinded us in the other direction. So, yeah, it's totally possible to be so intent on not seeing progress that you don't see obvious signs of progress. It's also possible to be so into this notion of American progress and exceptionalism. And, you know, we are always making our union more perfect and we're always becoming more of a shining city on a hill that 
you know, you fail to see the ways that inequality is widening and that schools are still segregated. And, you know, so I think when you get to that high level, you can kind of marshal evidence in either direction. There's a giant orange impediment to that interpretation that I see in the White House. Yeah. 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 And I think it's relevant to what we talked about at the beginning, where, you know, when you build giant systems, in, in this case, we're talking about social media, but you could also make the case about, you know, all kinds of massive systems that undergird our democracy. When you build those on certain assumptions that that are underdetermined by evidence, you know, you could wind up really screwing yourself over. When you just assume that people will tend toward progress and equality and they'll they'll always make good decisions and everything that rises to the top of your relevance algorithm will be something that will help you become a more engaged and informed citizen, that assumption's gonna be wrong a lot of the time. And, you know, so I agree that we shouldn't be blinded by our assumptions, either utopian or dystopian. That's where I, I really want to end my my readers thinking in a place more of contingency and kind of pragmatist fragility that, you know, things really could go in any direction and we shouldn't be un- unwilling to see progress, but we shouldn't be dogmatic about seeing it everywhere either. Well, on that, we agree. So um, again, Andrew, thank you for your time. And uh, I, I certainly recommend people read the book because our conversation did not actually give a faithful picture of what the experience is like reading the book. I seized upon certain topics that um, seem very important to hash out in public, and uh, you did that with um, no shortage of patience. So thank you, Andrew. Yeah, I really appreciate it. I mean, I, I, I enjoy talking about stuff I haven't talked about before, and it's, it was an interesting discussion. So thanks. Okay. As I said, that was more contentious in parts than I was expecting. On some level, I find these conversations tedious. I suspect many of you do as well. I think I'm going to have to keep recalibrating my inclination to get into the wokeness with people. Sometimes I decline to do it and receive some criticism from you all. And sometimes I do it and receive criticism. There may not be a sweet spot, but this is an issue we are going to have to sort out and really fast. In the next 12 months, this is really going to matter. Um, As if on cue, the day I record this, there's a story in the New York Times about a school security officer who was repeatedly being called the N-word by a high school student, and uh, he got into an argument with him, insisting that he not call him the N-word, and both actors in this drama are black, right? So you have a black student calling a black security guard the N-word, I think, 17 times or something, and he's saying, stop calling me the N-word and complaining about the fact that we now have a student who's using this word with abandon. But he used the word in describing this problem, and for that he was immediately fired. This is madness. This is a caricature of a caricature. This is an unfunny Onion article. And if you think this is just one of these little stories that means nothing, No, this is the face of the left right now. And whether or not it really is, the point is that it can be made to seem the face of the left any day of the week. We cannot afford this in the next 12 months. This stuff is so stupid and so toxic. It could not be improved if... Every Russian troll factory went to work on it full time. This is the perfect export politically to get Trump reelected. Think of how quickly this madness can spread. Just imagine what any of the Democratic candidates for president might say about an issue of this kind. If asked in an interview, what about this, Senator Warren or Mayor Pete? What are they likely to say? It seems to me that virtually every Democratic candidate at this point is poised to pander to the wokeness so much that they're capable of not making sense on an issue even this clear-cut. 
you just have to get them once sounding completely insane on these issues of cancel culture and race and Me Too and trans issues, whatever it is. Get them once visibly crossing the event horizon into the wokeness and you are ensuring four more years of Trump. I mean, honestly, the far left is as concerned about race as the Ku Klux Klan. And yet the problem is the far left is not the fringe. The far left is everywhere now, in academia, in tech, in journalism. So, I mean, I am, I mean, you can, you can hear it in me. I am really worried that we're going to screw this up. We being liberals who should be desperate to get rid of Trump. He is so eminently impeachable now. He should be entirely unelectable. And we are still capable of blowing this. Just take what it's like in Trumpistan. I think this is what is bothering many of us. You know, many of us who have never really thought about patriotism very much. Many of us who would never have been tempted to hang an American flag outside our doors. Many of us who have always been a little embarrassed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Right? I would certainly count myself here. What has happened is we are now being governed by a deeply un American president. He's all too American in one sense. Okay? He's everything that's wrong with America. It's like all of the cultural waste that got exported from America, you know, they just got beamed into space with our radio waves for a century. It's like that stuff fell back to Earth and congealed into a single person. So he's American in some sense, but this is a deeply un-American presidency. I mean, whatever America has stood for on the world stage, especially since 1945, I mean, for all our flaws, we have been a counterpoint to the lying, propagandistic, Orwellian nightmare of communism. Our democracy at home and our commitment to human rights abroad, for all our flaws and all our admitted hypocrisy, we've been a genuine counterpoint to the alternatives, to mere tyranny. And Trump appears to have single-handedly canceled that. Our reputation has been shredded. This is the lowest point of American standing in the world in anyone's lifetime, in particular with respect to our perceived values. Our abandonment of the Kurds was utterly shameful in every respect. That we did it, how we did it, what Trump said in the aftermath. I mean, my God. And then you add that to Trump's using the presidency to enrich himself directly, in plain view. And the worst part has been just the ceaseless undermining of our institutions, the justice system, the intelligence services, the press, so that we, we now live in a society so riven by misinformation and conspiracy theory, and worse, by a cynicism that devalues the very idea of facts. So that if we were to have another 9-11 scale event, there would very likely be no agreement about what happened. This is a point that Jonathan Haidt made recently on a panel. There would just be an explosion of conspiracy theories and lies and smears. And it may very well prove impossible for us to converge on a sane, pragmatic response. It's really hard to imagine what our country would look like the day after another 9-11. So we have to find some way back from this point. And, you know, Trump isn't the entirety of the problem. In some ways, he's a symptom of the problem. But, man, is he a major part of the problem. Right? I mean, what he has done to mainstream Republicans, I mean, this is one of the most amazing things about him. 
is how he diminishes everyone who comes into his orbit. Everyone loses their integrity. Honestly, it's like something out of Greek mythology. Think of the people who have worked for him, who have tried to explain or implement his policies, such as they have been, and who have since slunk out of the White House with their reputations destroyed. John Kelly, Michael Flynn, H.R. McMaster, John Bolton, Jeff Sessions, Rex Tillerson, Gary Cohen, James Mattis. I mean, James Mattis might have been the most universally respected military figure of our lifetime. The guy was an absolute legend. Now, honestly, he'll be lucky to be on Dancing with the Stars in fucking taffeta. It is unbelievable what happens to people who carry water for this man. Now, I'm sure someone is going to write a brilliant history of this period, and it will be fascinating to read. And I think the cynicism and cowardice among establishment Republicans who have enabled this president will be the most interesting thing to assess. But the idiocy on the left has gotten nearly as bad. Right? We have a personality cult on one side, propping up the president, and we have a cult of moral panic on the other. And those of us who are on the left, those of us who can, however incrementally, affect opinion on the left, we have to do whatever we can to get our heads straight over the next 12 months. A second Trump term is scarcely conceivable. And yet, given what the left is up to, it seems more than likely, even with Trump nearly self-immolating with scandals, every day something happens that would have destroyed a previous administration. It is so crazy. And yet the wokeness seems capable of outdoing the president on any given day. We have to get our heads straight here. Okay, and with that meltdown, I wish you all the best.